that, that what Hamas did was horrific, and there's no justification for it. And what is also true is that the occupation and what's happening to Palestinians is, is unbearable. And what is also true is that there is a history of the Jewish people that may be dismissed unless your grandparents or your great-grandparents or your uncle or your aunt tell you stories about the madness of anti-Semitism. And what is true is that there are people right now who are dying who have nothing to do with what Hamas did. And what is true, right? I mean, we can go on for a while. And the problem with the social media and trying to TikTok activism and trying to debate this on that is you can't speak the truth. You can pretend to speak the truth. You can speak one side of the truth. And in some cases, you can try to maintain your moral innocence, but that won't solve the problem. And so if you want to solve the problem, then you have to take in the whole truth. And you then have to admit nobody's hands are clean, that all of us are complicit to some degree. I look at this and I think back, what could I have done during my presidency to move this forward as hard as I tried? I've got the scars to prove it. This is my video update from Athens, Greece on this Sunday, midday, November the 5th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with von der Leyen's trip to Kiev. That's right. Van der Crazy is in Kiev. She arrived in, uh, in the Ukrainian capital yesterday, November the 4th, I believe. And uh, she is in Kiev meeting with Zelensky, talking about Ukraine's accession into the European Union. There is going to be a report, I believe on November the 8th, via the technocrats in Brussels, and they are going to give a general assessment as to how Ukraine is progressing with all of its EU reforms in order to enter the European Union. And so van der Leyen was uh, in Kiev meeting with Zelensky to provide some, uh, some support, some moral support, and to uh, get a progress update from the clown puppet leader himself. And this is what van der Leyen tweeted. Dear President Zelensky UA, we are impressed by the reforms Ukraine has made in the midst of a war. I am confident that you can complete the outstanding reforms very soon. If this happens, Ukraine can reach its ambitious goal. So the, the word is that uh, the report is going to be very favorable for Ukraine in order to enter the European Union. Even Annalena 720i, she uh, stated the other day that uh, the European Union is going to give a very favorable uh, report to uh, Ukraine, which would mean that possibly in the, in the next year, accession talks for Ukraine to enter the European Union could begin. But uh, I believe these talks, in order for these talks to begin, if I'm not mistaken, I think all of the EU member states have to uh, give their approval. That would mean that Hungary and Slovakia would have to approve the accession talks for Ukraine to enter the European Union to, uh, to begin. I don't see that happening, but who knows? Anything is possible. I really, really hope Ukraine uh, gets those session talks. I hope they begin. I hope Ukraine is fast-tracked into the European Union because uh, that would be the, the, the Alensky curse of all Alensky curses, wouldn't it? Ukraine entering the European Union would be the, the end of the European Union, 100% guaranteed. And so that would, be, that would be the mother of all Alensky curses, wouldn't it? Um, the, the downfall of the European Union because of, uh, of Alensky. Let Ukraine into the European Union. Please, please let Ukraine into the European Union. Boy, oh boy, would that be something. But uh, yeah, um, you know, van der Leyen, she's, uh, she's going to Kiev. She could have done this from afar. She didn't have to travel to Kiev, but she's going to Kiev because uh, she's going to, to a safer space something that's a bit more comfortable for van der Leyen, which is Project Ukraine, because when, uh, when she got involved in Israel, boy, did she uh, come under a lot of pressure. She almost lost her, her job uh, going to Israel and, uh, and pledging the EU's 
unconditional support to Israel and to Netanyahu that that really pissed off a lot of people in Brussels. It divided the European Union, and there were a lot of uh, Brussels officials and diplomats who circulated a document condemning van der Leyen. And, and basically, they were they were calling for her to step down because of her of her trip to Israel and uh, her support to <laughs> to excuse me to Netanyahu. So uh, she's going back to to a safe space. Um, the hatred. The hatred for Russia is something that unifies the European Union, with the exception of Hungary and Slovakia. Israel, that really divi divided the EU, but sanctions on Russia and, and, uh, and hatred for Russia, that's, that's something that, that unifies uh, EU support behind van der Crazy. And uh, Maria Zakharova, she put out a very clever uh, response to van der Leyen's arrival in Kiev. She said this, and I quote, so she, van der Leyen, she has returned to her primary field of expertise. That is what the Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman uh, said with regards to van der Leyen's tweet, van der Leyen's trip to, uh, to Kiev. Exactly right. She is going to, to Kiev because she's not going to get any, uh, any heat from visiting Kiev and talking about Ukraine accession into the EU and more weapons and more money and stuff like that. This is a this is a subject matter that unifies the uh, the technocrats and the kleptocrats in Brussels. And uh, there was a press conference with uh, with Alensky and uh, Van der Kreis. I believe Van der Kreis is going to speak to the Ukrainian Parliament either today or maybe she spoke to the Parliament yesterday. I think it's today that she's going to speak to to the Parliament. But uh, they did give a press conference. And uh, boy, was Alensky upset, very, very upset. And uh, he's upset with Zaluzhny, very upset with uh, the Ukraine general Zaluzhny because of the interview that uh, he gave to The Economist. And uh, basically, Zaluzhny said that Ukraine's big super duper counteroffensive has failed. He said that Ukraine is, uh, is losing the war, but Ukraine could win the war if it received uh, new wonder weapons, like new high-tech wonder weapons, a whole new military and new wonder weapons. Then Ukraine can win the conflict against Russia. If Ukraine receives the uh, the Death Star, then they could use that Death Star to to target planet uh, Alderaan, <laughs> planet Russia, and they can win the the conflict. And uh, Zaluzhny said that everything is uh, effectively at uh, at a stalemate. That is what uh, Zaluzhny told The Economist, and uh, Alensky did not like that at all. There is, there's without a doubt, a big, a big rift between Zaluzhny and Alensky. They never really did like each other, to be, uh, to be honest. But uh, now they're openly uh, talking about their, their hatred towards one another. And the New, the New York Times, they uh, ran an article with the title, Alensky rebuke of top general signals rift in Ukrainian leadership. The presidential office said General Valery Zaluzhny's declaration that the war is a stalemate was helpful to the Russians. Yeah, and uh, Alensky said, stalemate? What stalemate, he said. There is no stalemate. That is what, that is what Alensky said to the media during this press conference. It, there is no stalemate. Now give me money. <laughs> Keep in mind that uh, Alensky, to this day, he has not uh, admitted defeat in Bakhmut. He has, uh, he has not said that the big super duper counteroffensive has failed, though he did admit that the counteroffensive was, uh, was going to be scaled back. That's what he said like two weeks ago. He said that they're going to have to put an operational pause to the big super duper counteroffensive, but he has not admitted that it has failed like Zaluzhny admitted uh, to The Economist. And then Alensky said to the media, he, uh, he said that the reports from NBC News about negotiations with Russia, he said they're all, that's just false. He's like, no one is, uh, no one is pressuring Ukraine to negotiate with, uh, with Russia. Quote, now, none of the EU, US leaders, our partners, are putting pressure on us in terms of sitting down at the negotiating table with Russia, talking to it or surrendering something to it. This is what he told journalists. This is not going to happen, Alensky said. He also said that uh, 
he does not know who even publishes these reports. That's what Alensky told the press. He doesn't know who, who's publishing the reports about, about stalemates and uh, negotiations with Russia and stuff like that. Well, I can answer that question for you, uh, Alensky. NBC News is publishing these reports. Time Magazine is, is calling you delusional and messianic. And uh, The Economist is publishing these reports. There you go. Question answered. That's who's publishing these reports. <laughs> Boy, Alensky, he really is not the sharpest knife in the drawer, is he? Not a very bright uh, individual, the clown puppet leader, but he has become a multi-multi-billionaire. So it just goes to show you can be, you can be, uh, you can be a pretty dumb person, but you can still make billions. Uh, you've destroyed your country, of course. You're going to go, you're going to go down in history as the person that has destroyed Ukraine, but at least, uh, at least Alensky has purchased many, many homes. And uh, there was a tweet from Ilya Panomorenko. This is the guy that, uh, that was running the, the Telegram channel Morning Dagestan, and he, he helped uh, create the, the riot, spurred on the riot at, uh, at the airport in Dagestan, uh, last week, he's uh, basically this guy's just, in my opinion, he seems to be like a deep state asset that just hangs around Kiev and just uh, stirs up trouble. And he put out a tweet about a Russian missile strike which killed uh, 20 Ukraine uh, uh, military commanders and soldiers. And he was very upset about this. He tweeted, just unbelievable, at least over 20 Ukrainian troops with the 128th Mount Mountain Infantry were killed in a Russian missile strike. The command, the command mustered many troops in one place in the open for an artillery day decoration ceremony. The result is the tragedy. It's absolutely wild that such things still happen 20 months into the full-scale war with Russia. This is the important part now. Just pure Soviet-style snafu mess, and certain heads must now finally roll. So David Sachs caught on to this tweet from Ilya, and he said, Zelensky and Zeluzhny are openly criticizing each other in the press. And now one of the chief Ukrainian propaganda channels is calling for heads to roll. Absolutely right. So David Sachs is spot on. That's the key line to his tweet. Heads must roll. That's the, that's the deep state through um, Ilya Panamorenko. They are using him to basically put the, the word out that uh, someone's going to get fired in the Ukraine military. And me thinks that someone is going to be Zeluzhny. Zelensky is going to try to maneuver Zeluzhny out, if you believe that Zeluzhny even exists. But uh, that's, that's what's going on here. So uh, that was the comment from Alensky with regards to Zeluzhny. He's very upset, very upset with the media. There is no stalemate, according to Alensky. And yesterday it was, was it yesterday? I think it was Russia, Russia Unity Day. And so Ukraine, in order to, to gain back some media attention and show their collective West masters, including uh, Ursula van der Krezy, who was in Kiev, in order to show that they can... Uh, do damage to Russia and that they can still uh, fight, fight Putin and Putin's military. They decided to launch something like 15 missiles into, uh, I believe it to Crimea and uh, towards the, the Kerch Bridge and all of those missiles failed. From what I understand, Storm Shadows, S-200s and Storm Shadows were involved in, in this big strike, but uh, the Russian air defenses, they took care of everything. Uh, there was uh, the debris of one missile, which hit like, I think like a warehouse or something, and the warehouse caught on fire. But that was pretty much the extent of, uh, of the damage. So uh, Ukraine, obviously, for Russia Unity Day, and because van der Leyen was in Kiev, they did what they always do, which is they tried to, to hit at Russia and to get some, some media coverage um, over the weekend, and it failed. It completely failed. But um, Ukraine... Uh, Alensky, not Ukraine, Alensky also said during the press conference that, and this is pretty incredible, 
he said that Israel is getting all of the media attention. This is what he said as uh, Van der Crazy was sitting next to him during this press conference. He said, of course, it's clear that the war in the Middle East, this, conflicts, this conflict is taking away the focus. That is what Alensky said in what uh, Zero Hedge is describing as a very blunt admission that uh, Project Ukraine is, is no longer in the media headlines. And that's, that's concerning for Alensky because Alensky, what, what matters to Alensky the most is the media attention. So he just, he just said it, you know, plain and simple. Uh, Israel is getting all of, the, all of the attention and we're not getting any of the media attention anymore. So that's a pretty, pretty big admission from, uh, from Alensky with van der Leyen sitting right right next to him so uh talking about what's going on in israel this is turning out to be a complete disaster for uh the biden white house the the optics and everything that's happening in the war in israel and in gaza and uh the deaths and the, and, and, and the, the murder and the children that are dying and and the strikes on ambulances and, and all of the, the images and photos that are they're making their way to, to the inter, interwebs. This is, uh, this is really, really uh, hurting the Biden White House, especially as uh, they prepare for a Biden re-election in 2024. There were huge protests yesterday. We're talking massive protests in uh, DC, in Berlin, in Oslo, um, big, big protests. I think the, the protests in DC, I mean, these were, I haven't seen protests this, this big in, in a long, long time. And the protesters were actually yelling in DC, in the nation's capital, they were yelling, hey, hey, ho, ho, genocide Joe has got to go. That is, uh, that is not good news. If you're Jake Sullivan, if you're the election guy in the Biden White House, you're watching this go down and you're probably uh, freaking out. You are absolutely freaking out. And uh, at Time Magazine, they ran an article with the title, Biden's Gaza Stance Spurs Stunning Drop in Arab American Support. So uh, I don't think that the Biden White House is going to be able to repair this damage. Genocide Joe. That's what, uh, that's what they were chanting. Not good for, uh, for the Democrats, not good for the DNC, not good for the Biden White House. And uh, even, even if they swap out Joe for someone else like Gavin Newsom, I don't know if they can fix this. I don't know if they can win back the, the Arab American, the Muslim American, the Generation Z vote. Because uh, they're associating what's happening in Gaza with not only with Joe Biden, but they're associating it with uh, with the Democrat Party. So, uh, you know, for um, and they can't bring themselves to say ceasefire because they've boxed themselves in. They've all they've all pledged not to say the C word. Yesterday, you saw uh, Justin Trudeau. He was going to say ceasefire. And then he was like, you know, um, you know, we need to get to a su, 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 su. That's how was Trudeau yesterday. If you watch my video from yesterday and the opening of my, of my video was Justin Trudeau talking about the, uh, the war in Israel. And he was like, what we need to do is get to a su, 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 remember that song but uh, anyway uh, that was Trudeau because they're not allowed to say the word ceasefire like they've had an order from way up high I don't know who gave the order but from way up high they've told uh, all of the collective West leaders that they are banned from saying the word ceasefire and you have these huge crowds in DC all around the world telling Biden ceasefire and so Biden's using the word humanitarian pause and we need to pause the conflict. And, you know, he's dancing around the word ceasefire. And Netanyahu yesterday, keep in mind, Netanyahu hates Biden, right? So Netanyahu couldn't care less if, uh, if Biden suffers in, uh, in the reelection. 
in, uh, in the campaign for presidency because Netanyahu's like, there's going to be no ceasefire. We're going to continue to, to pummel um, a Gaza, just continue to, to hit a Gaza. And more images are going to come out. And more protesters are going to hit the streets. And it's just going to get worse and worse for the Biden White House. I mean, what the Biden White House needs is they need a quick resolution to this war. And the neocons, the neocons have hijacked this war and they've... Uh, They've started pushing for a conflict with Iran. So, I mean, the Biden White House, they've made a complete uh, diplomatic, political, military, strategic mess of, uh, of the war in Israel. And, um, and Netanyahu is saying no ceasefire. It's not going to happen because if Netanyahu calls a ceasefire, well, then, you know, his position in Israel is in jeopardy. So he's not going to call a ceasefire either. And uh, it's just going to get worse and worse for uh, for the Biden White House. And, and Israel's also losing a lot of support on uh, on the global stage. Uh, Turkey, Erdogan said that he's pretty much cutting off ties with with Israel. He's like, we can't talk to Israel. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting off ties with Israel. That was what Erdogan said. Of course, Erdogan, he he flip flops a lot. And today he can say one thing. Tomorrow he can say another. But you know, that's what Erdogan said. Uh, actually, let me get you his exact quote. I think I have it bookmarked here. Netanyahu is no longer someone we can talk to. We have given up on him. That's what Erdogan said. Uh, Sinn Féin in Ireland. Now, Sinn Féin is, uh, I think they're the biggest party in, uh, in Ireland. And uh, they're, they're pro-EU, from what I understand about Sinn Féin. They're super pro-EU, so they're completely aligned with the European Union and the globalists. But um, if I'm not wrong let me know people in ireland watching this uh this video if i'm not mistaken i think Sinn fein does have some roots in in its connection to like uh the the palestinian uh resistance there's 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 a history there now of course Sinn fein i think over the over the years over the decades they've they've aligned themselves with the globalist uh, eu kleptocrats but um the the leader of Sinn fein mcdonald she said that the israeli ambassador has to has to go that's pretty much what she said. The, the Israeli Defense Forces are engaging in a ferocious military offensive against the civilian population, breaking international law by targeting civilians, destroying civilian infrastructure, forcing mass population displacement, and cutting off vital supplies of water, food, medicine, and fuel, McDonald told reporters. She said that the Israeli ambassador's presence in Ireland has become untenable and that the ambassador should no longer enjoy diplomatic status in Ireland while Ireland refuses the imperative for ceasefire and as the suffering and death toll grow. That's what Sinn Féin, that's what, that's what Sinn Féin uh, said yesterday, the leader of the party. Untenable, the Israeli ambassador in uh, Ireland. So I said this a couple of days ago. I said you had Bahrain, you had Bolivia, uh, you have uh, Tunisia, Algeria, now Turkey. Um, Ireland is, 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 is starting up, and keep in mind, this is a pro-EU, pro-globalist party. This is not the, the government of, uh, of Ireland, but this is the, from what I understand, this is the biggest party. And uh, Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister of Israel, he understands that, uh, that the media war, the, the public opinion for the war is, is turning very, very much against uh, Israel. And so he announced via Twitter that he's going to be He's going to be traveling to the U.S. on what he's calling a media tour of New York and Washington. And it said, my goal is to help the Israeli government strengthen our position in public opinion in Congress and in the American government in order to give complete freedom of action to the commanders of the Israeli army to destroy Hamas. Public opinion in the world is not in our favor. For example, TikTok has 15 times more pro-Palestinian Hamas content and pro-Israeli content. I will do everything I can to change the situation and help the Israeli government. So uh, Bennett, he's going to, to, uh, to travel to the U.S. on a media charm offensive to try and get the public opinion to, to move more towards uh, Israel. And it's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. The, uh, the public opinion is, is hardening against Israel the more this, this conflict continues, the more this war continues. So I imagine what Bennett is going to end up doing is he's going to end up going to, uh, to the U.S., to D.C. and New York. And instead of being a media tour to try and, uh, and present the case that Israel is not 
uh, targeting uh, civilians or this is not a genocide or this is not some sort of cleansing of, uh, of Gaza. He's going to try and make the case that what they're doing is just targeting Hamas. But um, it's not going to work. I think what it's going to end up becoming, this media tour is going to end up becoming a, a tour promoting uh, censorship. I think that's where, where they're going to go. They're going to they're going to just come to the conclusion that they can't stop the the posts about what's happening in Gaza. And so they're going to try and, and censor it. That would be my guess. I could be wrong, but I don't think the uh, I don't think you're going to be able to. To turn this thing around if you're Israel or the Biden White House, I mean, they need a quick victory like the Biden White House. The plan was was safe for a quick uh, victory, right? They thought maybe they can get a quick win in uh, in Israel. That didn't happen because the goals were. Uh, can you can you uh, first of all the goals that they stated aren't the goals that we're seeing playing out, right? The goal was to eliminate annihilate Hamas. You know, people around the world they're not seeing that. Um, and, and the and the U.S. said that these goals. You know, how do you accomplish this? How do you accomplish the annihilation of Hamas? You know, it goes back to the whole war on terror thing from 2003. Uh, has the U.S. eradicated Al Qaeda? No. They didn't eradicate Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, not in uh, not in Iraq. And actually, they ended up uh, funding and working with Al Qaeda to overthrow Assad. So, I mean, you know, the the war on terror, the war on terror was a bad idea. The war against Hamas, declaring war against Hamas. And I'm going to get a lot of pushback for people who are pro-Israel. Declaring war on Hamas, in my opinion, was not the right strategic move. They should have taken a page out of Russia. And Brian Berletic said this yesterday in his video, and he's right. Uh, go to his video that he did yesterday talking about Hamas, where he reveals that Hamas has connections to the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, and, and their whole history. I'm not going to go over what Brian said. Brian does a very good breakdown of, uh, of Hamas. And we shouldn't confuse Hamas with, with the Palestinians in Gaza. But what, uh, what they should have done with the messaging from a diplomacy standpoint, from a foreign policy position, is they should have not declared war on Hamas. They should have taken a book, a page out of uh, the Russia SMO. They should have declared something like a, like a special terrorist operation. And they should have gone after Hamas, like specifically focused in on Hamas. But that's anyway, that's not what happened. And now we're seeing the whole thing play out. And this is turning into a massive uh, debacle for not only the Biden White House, but for the Democrats and the Democrat Party. So uh, that is what is going on in Israel. And let's do a couple of clown worlds and we'll wrap this, this video up. How am I doing on time? I'm doing very good on time for today in a very sunny Athens, Greece. And uh, let's return to, to Ukraine and for our clown world and talk about Adestovich, who, who senses, maybe he's been told this, I imagine he's been told this, but Aristovich senses that there's going to be a power vacuum in, uh, in Kiev, right? And uh, you have Zelensky who's going to try and fire Zeluzhny. We'll see if it works out or not, but he's going to try and dismiss Zeluzhny. Uh, Avdivka is going to fall to the Russians. The Russians are going to win Avdivka. That's going to be a disaster for Zelensky. Zelensky is going to travel to Israel. Um, van der Leyen is trying to prop up Alensky as best as possible. So Alensky, he's, you know, he's hanging on by a very, very thin uh, thread, right? And Aristovich, he senses this. So this is what Aristovich said yesterday, and I quote, a significant share of responsibility for the faith of the average citizen in our quick and beautiful victory lies with me personally. I created an illusion so that we would survive. Today I'm destroying it so that we can survive. That is what Alensky's one-time co-star in BFF, Aristovich, said yesterday. Basically, Ar Aristovich, he's presenting himself as the person who will put an end to the conflict, who will who'll negotiate with, uh, with Russia, and he's presenting himself as an honest actor. He is saying that an honest actor. He's saying that I lied to everybody. All, 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 the, all the past year and a half where I have been going on... Uh, on TV and saying that Ukraine is winning this conflict and Ukraine can defeat Russia, he's saying that was a lie. That is what he's saying in the statement. He said, I lied to you, but he's saying, I lied to you for your own good. I lied to you in order to keep hope alive. But now I'm, now I'm here to tell all of you, the people of Ukraine, that I was lying 
I did it for your own good, but uh, it's over. We've lost this conflict. So we need to negotiate with Russia in order to survive as a nation. That is what he is saying in this, in this statement. Wow. Wow. Is this not huge news? And keep in mind, Aristovich, I've been saying this for a while. Uh, Lord Bebo, he's been saying this for a while. His Twitter account has been analyzing Aristovich as well. Uh, he's doing a great job in uh, tracking Aristovich. Um, you know, Aristovich, he's, he's been allowed to, to, to stay alive for a reason. I mean, he's sitting in Kiev criticizing the Alensky government every day. They locked up Gonzalo Lira, free Gonzalo Lira. They locked up Gonzalo Lira because he was criticizing the Alensky government. But uh, Aristovich has been allowed to, uh, to criticize the Alensky government because there are people very high up who, uh, who are protecting Aristovich and have told the Alensky regime, don't touch this guy. And so Alensky is not allowed to, to arrest him or touch him. They're trying. They're trying to arrest him. They have some court cases against him, but nothing is sticking. So that's Aristovich. He's, he's, he wants to be president. He wants to be president. And I think he senses that sooner or later, Alensky's going to, it's going to collapse. When he loses Avdivka, when Avdivka falls to the Russians and he tries to fire Zeluzhny, I think that's when everything's going to really start to, to unravel for Alensky. And NBC News, they said that the Biden White House thinks Alensky at best has until the end of uh, the end of the year, maybe a little bit more. And then things are going to get very critical for the Ukraine military. They're running out of soldiers. They're running out of men to fight. And that's when uh, NBC in their report, citing officials in the Biden White House, that's when they said we're going to have to open up negotiations with Russia. But Alensky, he can't negotiate with Russia, right? Much like Netanyahu, who uh, can't come to a ceasefire, Alensky, he, uh, he can't negotiate with Putin. He negotiates, he negotiates with Putin, he's, he's finished. So anyway, that's, that was quite a tweet, uh, quite a statement from uh, Aristovich. Wow. I'm not even sure. Is that a clown world? Let's categorize that as a pre-clown world. Here's a clown world. This is coming from the Twitter account of Richard. This is a photo, a photo clown world. And uh, this is what he says in this clown world with this photo of Van der Crazy and Alensky side by side with, uh, with a train in back of them full of graffiti. And this is what Richard says. This is what depression looks like. Van der Leyen visiting Alensky. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's a fantastic tweet, by the way, from Richard. A fantastic tweet. And, uh, you know, uh, they, were, they were in Kiev and, and from what I understand, this, this little event in front of the, the train was about, um, it was about the honoring all the railway workers who uh, kept the trains uh, running during the, during the conflict with Russia. And that's what, that's what they were there doing at, at this event, standing in front of this, uh, this train. So uh, they're, they're in Kiev and, and they're honoring the railway workers because they managed to keep the, the trains running during the, the year and a half of, uh, of the conflict. And, and that tells you a lot, actually. I'll end this video on a, on a final note. That tells you a lot, doesn't it? The fact that for a year and a half, almost two years, Russia has not gone after the, uh, the railway system in Ukraine. And they could have. I don't want to hear from anybody that's, that's the pro-Ukraine, the NAFO crowd. Oh, Russia, Russia couldn't hit the Ukraine trains or the railway system or, or stuff like that. If Russia wanted to destroy the railway system of Ukraine, they would have destroyed it on day one like that if they really wanted to. But they didn't want to, even though they knew the, the trains were transporting troops and moving weapons. To the front line, Russia still opted to not destroy the railway system, the metro system, none of that stuff. That should tell you a lot as to how Putin, how Putin went about this conflict and how the, the, the Russian administration went about this conflict. Russian diplomacy, Russian messaging, the Russian military, how they went about this, uh, this conflict. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my video, everybody, thedoran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, 
and uh, and Rockfin, and also this, and also uh, Twitter X, and go to the Durant shop, pick up a hoodie, twenty percent off. Use the code the Duran twenty. Take care.